I like to uh, compare the importance of knowing history to an individual who wakes up one morning with amnesia, cannot remember who he is, where he came from, who his friends are. He would be helpless. I give a lecture It ends up with Vietnam Veterans Monument in Washington, D.C. What I do is I start going through the names. I start going through the ages of the people when they died. And most of them are the ages of people in my class. They're 18, 19, 20. And the point that I make is that um, before they ever got to learn why history mattered, history caught up with them. Most Americans are, in fact, pretty firmly convinced that history does not matter. Most Americans, I think, tend to think history is dead, done with, uh, you know, the ash bin of history. The worst thing you can say about somebody, really, if you want to be really cutting, is he's history. Too often history is taught as if everybody who lived in the past had read the textbook and knew what was going to happen. I think that you should approach the study of history with a spirit of curiosity. Be open-minded about the possibility that um, the story is much bigger than has been presented. What we need to remember is that there's not just one story of American history, there are many stories. And history was integrated. People occupied the same space in time, the same piece of land. But it's often a bitter connection through slavery, through Indian dispossession. Still, we're connected. We're not Europeans and we're not Africans. And we're not what the natives would have been if the Europeans and the Africans hadn't shown up. Modern Americans, at least, are held together by an idea, that and geography. We inhabit an awful big, diverse space, and we're a diverse people. And it's that intermingling, I think, of a vast, diverse geography and a lot of different people that makes our, our history what it is. of the United States begins with the story of a rich and varied landscape. Each region has its own ecosystem. Each one of the areas has a different mix, a different timing, different people who are there at the beginning, different cultures who are there at the point of contact, and also different connections in a geographic sense. But there's the other historical geography, that is the geography that people thought was there the attitudes they had toward the land and toward the world and toward the landscape. America is a place, but it's also an idea. I think that American history is about equality and about freedom. If we keep asking the equality question, then we won't go wrong. America is unique, perhaps, uh, in that it established itself on the basis of a set of political principles, principles of equality and, uh, and justice and liberty. We haven't always lived up to those ideals, and some of the great struggles in our history have been based upon people who were denied those rights, claiming them for themselves. African-American history raises the blatant contradiction in American society. All men are created equal. Our notions of Americans as people committed to equality and so on. Well, how can we be a people committed to those things, believing in those documents, when at the same time, the people who wrote those documents, who articulated those beliefs, were themselves the holders of human beings in human bondage? America the place. America the idea. Together, they forged the American identity. Who is an American? What kinds of people have been included in the notion of American? What kinds of people have been excluded at various times in our history from the notion of American? I think for many years, we saw the American culture and American society as sort of a, a, a bouillon, uh, a soup in which everyone would blend and melt into it. And now, certainly at the, at the beginning of the 21st century, we understand that American society is more like a stew. There is this stock of, of sort of Western European flavor, but there are also phenomenal segments of American society that have been flavored by that stock, but still retain their own ethnicity. So in an odd way, American came to mean for a long time people who were not American, people who, who came from across the ocean. And 
The odd thing about European culture in the Americas is how little attention Europeans wanted to give to the people who are here to begin with. For generations and generations, Native American people lived in this continent before the coming of the Europeans. And there was the rise and the fall of different cultures and very sophisticated societies, which all have a very rich culture and history of their own. American society has always been a multiracial, multicultural society. When Columbus came, he came bringing yet another cultural group and another racial group to take their place beside an already multicultural, multiracial society. And in fact, that is central to what America is. mountains are there was a big lake behind the river the coyote made a stick and dug on top sang a song and the river broke through the Indian people moved down to the river the coyote went up the river saw that they didn't have much to eat he went down to the ocean saw salmon swimming in the ocean he used his power told the salmon to swim upstream that's how the Columbia River was made and that's why the salmon swim upstream Today, cities like Portland, Oregon, are bustling urban landscapes. But for centuries before the Pacific Northwest was settled by immigrants of European stock, it was inhabited by Native Americans. Tribes such as the Chinook, Tillamook, Cayuse, and Walla Walla lived in what are today the states of Washington and Oregon. The Northwest part of North America supported an extraordinary diversity of both coastal and inland cultures before European contact. The densest populations were at the coast and inland by the sides of lakes or on riverbanks like that of the Columbia where there were seasonal salmon runs. There is this stereotype of North American Indians up in the Northwest being salmon fishermen. They were actually a great deal more than that, but there is no question that the seasons of fish, like salmon, or smaller animals, played a vital role in their economies. Indian peoples of the Northwest developed distinctive artistic and social customs. The art itself is never just art for the art's sake. It always has a profound meaning. If you look, for example, at the totem poles, all of them have intense symbolic meaning as genealogies, as commemorations of clans, and so on. We are talking about societies where kin groups were of enormous importance, and the leaders of kin groups were very important ritual and political and trade leaders, and these people claimed ancestry from divine ancestors. This gave them their authority, and these clan affiliations were of enormous importance in determining status and so on. Today, Many Native American tribes still live in the Pacific Northwest, and for some, salmon fishing is still their livelihood. But they are only a fraction of the number estimated to have lived there before Europeans came. We believe that our point of creation is in the Channel Islands itself. That we were created there and lived and, and grew to the point where we needed to move. And that it was the goddess Hutash that sent us over from the islands to the mainland to populate. The California coastal region today holds one of the world's most thriving cultural and technological centers. But centuries before there was San Francisco or Silicon Valley, 
the area was well populated with Native Americans. Tribes such as the Pomo, Miwok, Ohlone, and Chumash lived in what is today Central California. The Ohlone of the San Francisco Bay Area were made up of some 40 loosely affiliated independent tribelets and spoke as many as 12 different languages. The Chumash, one of California's largest tribes, lived near present-day Santa Barbara in villages sometimes containing a thousand or more inhabitants. The Chumash are rightly famous for their very elaborate and highly effective hunting and gathering, which is based predominantly on the ocean, although not entirely. I mean, they did harvest acorns. The illusion is that they lived this wonderful life, that this was a Garden of Eden. Actually, it's a high-risk environment, and in fact, there is evidence of fighting and competition for resources. The critical thing about the Chumash was the fact that they were not self-sufficient. They kept constant relations with other societies. They even traded as far as the Southwest. Why? Because in an unpredictable environment like this, you need and depend closely on other people. Like other Indian peoples, the Chumash had developed a unique and complex culture. What the Chumash are most famous for is the tomol, the planked canoe. And in these boats, they ventured right off to the islands 20 miles out and would fish and trade over enormous areas. Another thing which the Chumash are famous for was their astronomical knowledge. It's said in my family that the stars are the footsteps of our ancestors. When we look up to them, we are looking at ourselves, a reflection of ourselves. In the ancient practices, children were named according to the stars. The constellations were very important for major ceremonies and also times of gathering, even knowing when certain cycles of animals or fish were about could be judged by these things. Colonization by the Spanish and later by the American settlers decimated the Native Americans in California. But the population began to arise again during the 20th century. Today, many Native Americans of California carry on the traditions of their past. Today, New Mexico and other parts of the Southwest strongly reflect the presence and influence of Native American cultures. While large cities like Santa Fe have grown up around them, many Native American tribes have continued to live in the Southwest, some of them on their original Pueblos. The people uh, living in the greater Southwest, uh, the Santa Fe area specifically, prior to European contact, um, are peoples that we lump together under the term Anasazi, which um, really means ancestral peoples. The people living in that area were farming peoples, living in large villages, and doing the things that uh, we're familiar with, trade, communication, warfare, survival. They had to deal with a weather that was quite capricious, and so the people living there had to utilize certain strategies to get by. They farmed multiple areas at once. People created fields on the mesas and in the river bottoms and in the arroyos so that any one year you would have a crop in any of those places, even if some of those places had failed. The ancestral Pueblo peoples had an unusual system of power sharing. In terms of their social organization, the villages probably had clans that were organized into larger groupings we call moieties, which is a, a, an anthropological term meaning half. During the summer, the summer moiety group would have a leader that would basically call the shots, and the reins of power then would be handed during the winter over to the winter moiety leader. Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon was the largest and most elaborate Pueblo de Anasazis ever constructed. Built sometime during the 10th century, it was abandoned by the 13th century for reasons that are still not entirely certain. <laughs> 
It's a huge condo complex of rooms stacked one on top of another, big plazas that we imagine were used for ceremonies, kivas set into those plazas used for rituals and, and meetings of clans and other groups. And so it was a, a seething mass of humanity. The major cultural achievement for the ancestral Pueblo peoples is the perfection, if you will, of village life. The long experimentation they had with living together in large groups, sharing resources, and in many, many cases sharing the same walls. How ritual reconfigures and recreates village on an annual basis, how a community really does survive together as a community. Unlike most other pre-Columbian Indian structures, some of the ancestral pueblos have survived and are still inhabited. And descendants of the ancestral pueblos still perform many of the traditional rituals. The city of St. Louis on the Mississippi River was once a frontier town and made its name as the Gateway to the West. But a thousand years earlier, near the same spot, there existed a city that was the largest urban community in the United States before the 19th century. Cahokia Mounds is situated in what we refer to as the Great American Bottom. It's a large expanse of floodplain that's been carved out over hundreds of thousands of years by the meandering of the Mississippi River. There are numerous uh, lakes, marshes, and sloughs, and backwater areas that provided all kinds of fish and waterfowl, so it was a very productive uh, source of food. Plus, it provided a very fertile soil for agriculture, and these people were agriculturalists. For 900 years, from approximately 700 A.D. to 1600 A.D., the mound builders dominated the Mississippi Valley. Cahokia, was the largest and most enduring of the Mississippian cultures. By far the largest mound, not only at Cahokia Mounds, but in this country is Monk's Mound, which dominates the, the center of the site. It's also the largest prehistoric earthwork in the Americas. We had as many as 120 mounds during the Mississippian period in, in what we call Cahokia proper. The majority of those mounds were what we call platform mounds. They're rectangular and flat top. These were mounds that were used not for burials, but for buildings, to elevate their important buildings, important people higher than everybody else. It's a way of separating the sacred from the, the common, so to speak. It was a stratified social system with what we refer to as the paramount chief at the top, and he probably lived on top of Monk's Mound, or at least ruled from there. Cahokia was at the center of a trade network that spanned most of the continent from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, the Appalachians to the Rockies. The rivers themselves were transportation routes. They were the superhighways of their day. And they, traveling in their dugout canoes along these river highways, we find a lot of exotic items coming here from different parts of the country. By the time Europeans arrived in North America, the people of Cahokia had disappeared. But contemporary tribes such as the Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Natchez are descended from the mound builders of the Mississippian culture. The Cherokees had an island in the uh, ocean, and the uh, island sank, and they left, and they came from the south north. They came in in certain groups, which were 13 clans at the time, and a number of them got lost about the way. And they came north until they, until the rain turned white, and then they turned east until the sky met the earth. And so we can say that's the Appalachian Mountains. The British established the city of Charleston in 1670, but the southeastern region of the continent had been inhabited for thousands of years before that. Different groups in the southeast had very different kinds of adaptation. Some groups lived in very large towns, some groups lived in very small bands, foraging, others farmed. 
the larger societies in the southeast tended to be in large communities, and some of these can be quite large, tens of thousands of people. In the southeast Atlantic states of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, there were three flexible but distinct environments to which the Native Americans adapted. On the South Atlantic slope, there are certain kinds of environments that make it easy to make a living foraging. And while there are farming societies and foraging societies throughout that region, there are particular kinds of resources that are densest on the South Atlantic slope. In the same way, when you get beyond the fall line and into the Piedmont, there are certain kinds of resources that are most common there, and a certain scale of society that can be supported. As you keep moving up into higher and higher elevations, you end up with groups like the Cherokee, who are living in relatively small valleys, relatively narrow floodplains. They're farming, but they're also using a very broad range of resources, which are simply unavailable on the South Atlantic slope, and vice versa. As in other parts of the country, tribal distinctions in the Southeast were fluid and not always clearly delineated. We tend to think of tribes as discrete units, as having boundaries and, and staying the same over time. They didn't. And groups like the Catawba represent groups that are named at a time of contact. Over time, that group is changing, becoming an ally of, a, of some groups, an enemy of other groups. Those alliances are shifting over time, and the actual group that constitutes the Catawba is changing over time, just as all the other groups are changing. The Native Americans of the Southeast are probably the most politically complex group in ancient North America. They accomplished an enormous amount that we've lost today. New York City is one of the dazzling achievements of Western civilization but it was once only a small island sparsely inhabited by Native Americans known as the Lenape. Further north in upstate New York was the home of the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Long House. These were the ancestors of the Iroquois tribes, the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. If you think of the geography of Northeastern uh, North America, uh, it's a uh, a region of forests, rivers, lakes. It's a region that is conducive to farming and hunting and fishing. And most of the Indian peoples in the Northeast did all three. So they would often inhabit villages that were occupied a certain portion of the year. And the groups would come together as a band or as a tribe for planting in the spring, harvesting in the late summer, and then would disperse uh, into the hinterlands for hunting, for instance, in the fall. The various Indian peoples of the Northeast encountered and interacted with one another, sometimes in warfare, sometimes in peace. There are alliances and uh, common causes between Iroquois and Algonquian peoples. There are wars in which Iroquois and Algonquian people take sides on the same side. And of course, there are, there are intermarriages between Iroquois and Algonquian people. So I think that many of our notions of, of tribes as, as sort of static ethnic units uh, need to be questioned, and we need to take more account of the tremendous flexibility and fluidity that existed between groups, as well as the, as the barriers that sometimes developed between them. Haudenosaunee tribes are famous for the long houses they lived in. Communal housing structures where they ate, slept, and stored food and other items. They are also well known for a more egalitarian treatment of women than many other tribes. I think in the Northeast, the power and the influence of women centered on the village, on the homes, and the field. That the role of the women was primarily one of cultivation cultivating crops and cultivating children. And in that sense, they are giving life and they are promoting life. The role of men more often takes them outside of the village. They are away from the village at war or hunting, which of course are both activities that involve the taking of life. In ancient times, the Haudenosaunee tribes fought amongst each other, enduring an endless cycle of raiding and retaliation 
But sometime before the coming of Europeans, the Haudenosaunee found a way to live in peace with each other. They formed a confederation which would later be known as the Iroquois League, an early form of democracy that would make a deep impression on European settlers who arrived later. On the eve of Columbus's arrival, North America was a thriving web of approximately 500 Native American societies, each one a unique adaptation to its surroundings and a unique expression of culture. And the most striking characteristic of Native American cultures in 1492 was that they had been changing and constantly changing long before Europeans came. We tend to think of Native North America as what, what was seen by Europeans after 200 years of depopulation and disease. And it's a very biased view. A thousand years ago, Native North America had a very large population. It had large towns, complex political systems, complex economies, trade routes rivaling anything seen during the Roman period. A very complex civilization that's almost completely lost. We have an enormous amount to learn about human, biological, and cultural diversity from. We have a lot to, to learn from about relationships with the environment. We have a great deal to learn from them about spirituality, about alternative ways of looking at the world. In the past 10 years, our view of Native American history has changed radically. And that's a view that's only now becoming informed by Native American testimonies. If you also include all the new archaeological work that's been done in the past 20 years, I suspect that in the next decade or two we'll have a completely different view of what Native America looked like in the century before European contact.